So this study is on a, uh, a few scriptures that are surrounding a subject, which I saw when looking around for other scriptures, and I kept finding this argument going back and forth, and it's something I've heard before. Basically, it's often argued around by different media outlets, uh, people that uh, use this as some kind of uh, an argument. Ultimately, the way it appears is do Christians have a right to defend themselves? Although what it's about is issues and matters of self-defense, Christians arming themselves, uh, even getting into issues of like... Uh, it's tied into the Second Amendment. Ultimately, this nation, the United States, guarantees its citizens' right to bear arms to defend themselves, their pursuit of life, life, liberty, happiness, that's in the Declaration of Independence. The Constitution of the United States says that the people have the right to bear arms and have a well-regulated militia. And if you know Old English, well-regulated doesn't mean government sanctions, regulations, and restrictions. What well-regulated means in the Old English is well-trained, well-disciplined, well-regimented. So, what it guarantees its people is not only to own and bear arms, but to use them well, to be well-trained in their use. That's what that's saying. So... The laws of the land were written by Christians and Jewish people. They were the ones who had comprised the majority of those who had come over and founded the United States. And the writing of the law of the land is built from the bottom up. It guarantees that the people are the ones who determine how things are governed. They determine who their leaders are and how they do things. The leaders, the high offices, answer to the people. It's not the other way around, despite what all the barking dogs high, higher up in office try to argue. They have no power over the people. The law of the land guarantees that the people dictate how they live, but it is within certain moral boundaries as determined by the writing of the law. And if they, are, if they break those, then they have to pay the penalty. The crime and punishment and justice system of this land is there for that purpose. And as I'm going to get into, just as the Bible commands that certain, certain things require the penalty of death, and Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he is the word of God, and the scriptures are God-breathed. They are the word of God. It doesn't mean that God's an angry, vengeful creature He's defending his kids. He is defending his family, his household, from wicked reprobates who follow after the devil in his destructive ways. So, just to put it out plainly there, since so many supposed ministers try to get around this subject, it's one of those untouchable, controversial things, but the Bible states things plainly, and because nobody else is, I suppose I'm going to have to get into it. So... This, to start with, if you look at the span of scriptures from Old Testament to New Testament, God lays out plainly sets of laws, many of which are, consider, or are, are against things considered abomination. And if you read Leviticus, in some of the chapters, there is the sin and the penalty. And... If you look into the history of the laws of the United States, certain things that the Bible called abomination with its punishment were likewise in the writing of the law in the United States. But over time, wicked people in high office started erasing these things and changing it. And the, the more lenient the nation had become towards sin, 
the more things begin to fall apart. And it has happened with every other nation out there. The farther they go from God, the more they marginalize Christians and persecute them and kick them out, the more things fall apart. They drop into third world status. The people are in squalor. There is what well, there is like internal disputes, wars, strife, misery, hardship, tribulation, anguish, and it follows the pattern of Deuteronomy chapter 28. If you care to look these things up at all, you're going to see you're going to see the pattern. So many of the the people of faith whose names are remembered in the Bible, particularly he Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament, pointing to that which chronicles people in the Old Testament, many of whom were men of war, people who went to battle for the Lord their God, who took up the sword and defended their families, their homes, their lands, the, their brothers and sisters, their nation, against all comers. David, a man after God's own heart, was also a man of war, and God did not rebuke him for slaughtering the enemies of Israel. What he did rebuke him for was spilling innocent blood. And for committing adultery, which also destroys households. So, on top of those, there is some other things out of the New Testament which surround this controversy. One of them that I see is John the Baptist dealing with soldiers. Do violence to no one, exact no more than what you do for your wages, be content with them. Well, people seem to use this against law enforcement and military in an argument against anyone who happens to have a gun. So, law enforcement exists to protect civilization against godless dogs and criminals and adulterers and pedophiles and all the other reprobates that have no self-control, don't want any self-control, are utterly depraved, and not fit to live in society. Which, strangely, leftist leaders and people in high office nowadays seem to think that these are their bros and are releasing them, getting rid of crime punishment and the justice system, and are, are letting these people just go do as they please. Such a thing is an abomination. And so... I can remember the train of thought on it. That would be great. But basically, what the scriptures point out here with what John the Baptist was saying was against extortion. So unjust violence against people is what he was speaking against. Soldiers who... would not be spoken against over anything and would meet such a thing with great violence. If somebody pointed out some injustice, um, they, these people likely were of the sort who didn't care. They, they enjoyed their job and being rough with people and took as they pleased. That's what he was going against. But when a law enforcement officer is punishing some wicked person who did wrong against somebody who is innocent, who is living their life, who is, according to the law of the land, utilizing their rights to their property and their family to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness within the confines of the laws. If you think that's an unfair thing, the... <laughs> There, there's something clearly wrong with you, because civilization and what the Bible instructs for nations, for people to live godly, peaceful, joyful lives, this is what the laws of the land are written around. And this defends personal freedoms, your right to earn a wage, to build a life, to own property, to leave an inheritance to your children and grandchildren, 
And if you're so woke that everything proceeding out of my mouth on this is somehow infuriating you, you probably need deliverance, or at least so some degree of discipline to drive foolishness far from you. And that is based on a proverb, the wisdom of God. So... See here, this is Luke chapter 22. So, Luke chapter 22 is starting around the Lord's Supper and the plot to kill Jesus. Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. The disciples argue about greatness. Jesus predicts Peter's denial. And then he gets into supplies for the road, knowing what's ahead. So starting from verse 35, he said to them, When I sent you without money, bag, knapsack, sandals, did you lack anything? And this is when he sent them two by two ahead of him into the cities to prepare the way for him for, the, for ministry. And so he was teaching them, to rely on him and on his Father and on the Holy Spirit. That way, they knew his voice and knew to move at the direction of the voice of God. So, he made sure that they could not rely on their own strength or ability for that. So, that was their training period. Now, he's about to leave them and start the church. And so... What he tells them in verse 36. But now he who has a money bag, let him take it. Likewise, a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And here he's pointing out that those who follow after him will likewise be considered transgressors and wicked people and troublemakers by the rest of the world. Just as Israel was in the Old Testament, so are the church in the New Testament, because the devil doesn't like his schemes being interfered with by the Lord. And because the Lord also utilizes his people in building his kingdom, he's going to target them also. So... The scripture is surrounding turn the other cheek. If somebody strikes you on one cheek, turn to them the other. This is dealing with petty disputes and insignificant, insignificant strivings, uh, conflicts, uh, bullcrap among people, uh, little hissy fits and spats and tantrums. And it's the, the like that you encounter at work and wherever you go, non-threatening stuff, small-time stuff, which ultimately doesn't do anything major or accomplish anything big. What he's speaking of here in the scripture is defense of life, defense of family, defense of significant things concerning your continued future. And so... Here, in other, in other Gospels, he even speaks to how those who kill you are going to think they're doing a holy service to God. This speaks of empty religion being threatened by the real way of the Lord, which results in the fruit of the Great Commission, the signs following, devils being cast out, miraculous healing, diverse miracles, the even dead being raised, they're going to see this as threatening whatever pyramid scheme they might have going on or falsehood or scheme or facsimile of a supposed church when it's empty and dead and is pretty much a mausoleum. So the Pharisees were likewise against Jesus, the priesthood that was supposed to be ministering to the people at the time. So, in verse 37, 
For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. He was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have none. So they said, Look, here are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. So, there's that. So, Romans chapter 12, which is another one which people like to use against the idea of Christians ministering discipline. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, that is, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, love what God loves, hate what God hates. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, being fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope and patience and tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, unmovable, distributing to the needs of the saints and given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So, there is another one where... People sling that around, even with the idea of owning firearms. I've heard that one slung around. Uh, you, you think you need to defend your house? Uh, you're a Christian? Don't you believe in the Bible? Don't you believe that what God says that he's going to avenge you and protect you? Well, why do you need that? And uh, this also deals with petty squabbles, um, strivings, uh, the, the insignificant things. Somebody, like, strikes you, you know, like, knock down, drag out fights like I used to have with, with my brother early on in life. And uh, you know, over stupid stuff. Not life-threatening, but uh, the, the disputes like uh, of the likes of what you'd see at work. Um arguments over politics, ar arguments over uh, a favorite team. Uh, I've seen it get rather energetic before, but none of that was in any way threatening anybody's life. That's what this is speaking to. And then for, like, like somebody borrowing a tool and not returning it, the Lord will repay for that. For the for things concerning theft, uh, th things like that, uh, there there's clear examples in the scriptures. One of them is the uh, the letter to Philemon, where this person had a servant who fled his household, taking with him much valuables from Philemon, and the apostle Paul wrote a letter to him assuring him not to be offended. He found the person, trained him up in the way of the Lord and is sending him back and to accept him back uh, without any kind of bitterness, accepting him back as one of, the, uh, one of the brothers in Christ. So the Apostle Paul even says, if you still require a payment, have it pinned to my account. I'll pay it. So... That right there regarding Christian conduct in such matters. So, that being said, if you have some armed bandit in your house that's going to get rid of you if you try to stop him, then it's game on. Discipline as you see fit. I know in New York State there's something called Castle Doctrine, if you look it up. So... Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. So, this 
mainly is concerning your daily dealings with difficult people. So, that's the context that I see here. What the Lord said about buying swords was dealing with a far more life-threatening environment. So, there is no contradiction in scriptures between these. You need the Lord to heal your mind, to teach you, to reveal his word to you, and you need to read the surrounding verses, the surrounding passages, the surrounding chapters, and you'll have a better idea of things. So, Luke chapter 6, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Go to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Just as you want men to do to you, do also to them likewise. And those who live for the Lord, those who really do, the Lord meets their needs. They are blessed. They have overflow. They have abundance. That's what the Bible clearly points to. And if you're obeying the whole counsel of God through the scriptures, then you're not going to be lacking for anything. And there are other ministers who teach on this often, who present this far better than I. Jonathan Shuttlesworth is one of those people. Rodney Howard Brown is another person. Andrew Womack is yet another. And... Those just naming three of these people. They believe in all that the Bible teaches, even concerning gifts of the Spirit, the, uh, the Great Commission, all these things which are instructed to the Church that God has not ever spoken of an end for. While the Church is here, the Great Commission is still on. And while the church is here, the operation of the Holy Spirit in his people in full power and might is still happening. You can't pick and choose. You're either all in for him or you're lukewarm. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. So here it's showing you. You have to go out into the world and make disciples of all the nations. You have to get out there and preach and teach the word. You have to get out there into the world and let your light shine in your conduct, in your speech, in what you do. And... Ministry is not convenient. It is not at a convenient time. It's when you're faced with difficulty and difficult people, when what you've been instructed in by the Bible, by the Word of God, by the Holy Spirit, it is then when it is most critical. It's for that time. So that's when your character is going to show. As stated before many times, a quote from someone named Chris D'Amico, who came up to the Elbian area years ago. You are like a tea bag. When you get dropped in hot water, what is in you will come out. So, verse 34, if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back, but love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. 
Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. And that also is different from tithes and offerings spoken in Malachi chapter 3. There it clearly states, it's to the temple, and the New Testament, it's to the church. And if it's a soul-winning ministry, that's the best soil to sow it to. If you remember the parable of the soils spoken of by the Lord. The parable of the sower, as some people remember it as. Four kinds of soil. One was the best. The others didn't produce as much or didn't produce at all. So, you have to sow to ministries that follow the pattern of the Great Commission if you're going to have the results that you're looking for from it. Then 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, and having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created, to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So, as I've pointed out in the description, there's other things which I've seen circulating that are controversies over what the Bible plainly teaches, but those who do not have the Holy Spirit in them will never be able to make sense of what the Bible plainly teaches. They find controversy over it, they argue it out, they reason uh, about it, they somehow think they're exempt from it, or that God's going to wink at the sin they practice. Oh, it's just a little sin. Uh, no, that little sin is exactly what's going to keep you out of the kingdom of God. Jesus spoke it, God the Father spoke it, the Holy Spirit also speaks it. In Old Testament, in the Gospels, and in the New Te Testament, in the letters of the Apostles. So, it's a pattern throughout the span of scriptures, so I think it's something worth paying attention to. So, it's one of the first things put forward in the Bible, too, God's design for humankind. And throughout history, God's design has been shown to be the best thing to go with. And it isn't hard to figure out, but some people in these last days, as the Bible plainly speaks, Israel is God's prophetic time clock, as pointed out in Scripture. Minds get so reprobate, they do things that are not convenient, and they go running off into all kinds and all levels of stupid that even unsaved people that, for the most part, are still solidly reasonable, even they see something wrong. So, blessing belongs to the children of God. The curse of the law is all that the wicked will have. And it is very apparent. But to get blessing, you need Jesus. It starts with him. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through his Son, Jesus Christ. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. But the free gift of God is eternal life through his Son, Jesus Christ. For if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, you shall be saved. And if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead... This will result in righteousness and sanctification. It starts there. That is the root of it. That is the first step. Those who trust in him will not be disappointed. This is Romans chapter 10, verses 8 to 13. And even Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The people were asking the apostle Peter, what do we do? After he had preached to them and taught them. On the way of the Lord. He said, Repent of your sin and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God to dwell in you, to be your counsel, your helper, your guide through life. And 
without him, you're not going to get through what's coming on the world. I'm going to say a quick prayer for you. Lord, bless these people with long and healthy lives. Do a quick work in their hearts. Lord, that if they have not received you as Lord and Savior, I pray they will do so now. So all of you who need Jesus, repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me and cleanse me. Set me free. Jesus, thank you that you died for me. I believe that you are risen from the dead and that you are coming back again for me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Give me a passion for the lost, a hunger for the things of God, and a holy boldness to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm forgiven, and I'm on my way to heaven because I have Jesus in my heart. Amen. So, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I tell you today that your sins are forgiven. Always remember to run to God and not from him because he loves you. He has an awesome plan for your life. So, I hope that helps you. God bless you.